Hello and welcome back to Learn Acadian. Today we're going to talk about the Sheen system. The Sheen system is the last of our four main verbal forms and it gives verbs a causative effect. So what appears in the G system with the meaning to conquer in the Sheen system would appear with the meaning to cause to conquer, to help conquer, or to enable to conquer. So let's look at some infinitive forms to better understand the meaning of the Sheen system. Here I have the paradigm for our Sheen system infinitive. So as you can see, it begins with the letter Sheen, which just to reiterate is an S with a hook on top, which denotes the SH sound, followed by a U, our first root letter, and then it's immediately followed by our second root letter, another U, our third root letter, and our case ending, which here we have the nominative um. So here we have the word shuprusum, which comes from the root letters P, R, and S, which in our dictionary or G system infinitive form would appear as parasum. So in the G system, these root letters are going to give us the meaning of to divide. But in the Sheen system infinitive, these same root letters are going to give us the meaning of to cause to divide or to help to divide. Here we have the word shud bubum, which means to cause to speak. And this comes from the root letters D, B, and B, which we would find in the dictionary as the G system infinitive debabum, which would mean to speak. So as you can see, this G system meaning to speak in the she system infinitive is going to take on a causative effect, giving us the meaning to cause to speak. Before looking at our other paradigms for the Sheen system, let's take a look at the prefixes and suffixes which we're going to add to these stems. So you'll notice immediately that the prefixes and suffixes which we use in the Sheen system are the exact same as the ones we use in the D system. And that's because the Sheen and the D system are a pair, while the G and the N system are a separate pair which each use different prefixes and suffixes. And this is something important to remember because when you see a U or a TU or a NU at the beginning of a verb, you can immediately narrow down what system you're probably looking at. So for first person singular common subjects, which would be like I, and by the way, common shows that there's going to be no denoted masculine or feminine gender. It could be either one. So we would have an U, a short U. For our second person singular masculine, we would have a TU. For our second person singular feminine, a TU with a long I at the end. And for our third person singular common, we have an U. And this subject would be like he, she, or it, because it's common and has no particular gender. Now it's important to note that this third person singular common is the exact same as our first person singular common. So we're going to have to use context in order to differentiate between the two. Our first person plural common would be nu, that's a subject like we. Our second person plural common, tu, with a long a at the end. This would be like y'all or you guys or you all. Uh, our third person plural masculine would be oo with a long u at the end, and this is a masculine they for the subject. Our third person plural feminine would be an oo with a long a, and this is a feminine they for our subject. So here I have our three main tenses for sheen system verbs. Durative, or future present, preterite, or simple past, and perfect. So I've added dashes where we would add our prefixes and suffixes to the stem, and you'll notice that each sheen system verb features a sheen at the beginning of the stem, which is followed by an A. Now, this is always going to occur before the three root letters, so it's just good to know because when you see a consonant, sometimes it can be tempting to assume it's a root letter, but if this first consonant is a sheen, double check to see if, rather than being a root letter, this is just part of the stem. Now, you'll also notice that there's no thematic vowel in the sheen system, and this is really important when we're translating because it can allow us to differentiate between different tenses of the Sheen system. So if we find an A between the second and third root letter, we immediately know that we're looking at a durative or future present verb. If we find an I, then we know that this definitely can't be future present, and it's going to be either preterite or perfect. And we can then look for the perfect T in order to differentiate between the two. Using the root letters P, R, and S from parasum, which in the G system means to divide, let's look at how we would translate are different tenses of Sheen system verbs. You'll notice that I've added two as the prefix for each verb, and this is going to give us a second person singular masculine subject, you. So for our derivative, we have to chapras, which we would translate as you will cause to divide or you cause to divide. Now you could also translate this as you will help to divide or you help to divide. And this is kind of up to context with how we want to do it. 
but it's always going to be a causative meaning of our sheen system verb. So in the preterite, we would read to chapris as you caused to divide or you helped to divide with that simple past meaning of the verb. In the perfect tense, we have to chapris, which means you have caused to divide or you have helped to divide with the perfect reading, which is slightly more continual, but also in the past. So here I have three sheen system verbs, which we're gonna translate. And I'm gonna quickly run through what the roots mean in the G system, so that on your own, you can pause the video and practice changing the meaning of these roots into a causative sheen system meaning. So first, ushashrika comes from the roots sheen, r, and q, which we would find in the G system infinitive as shirakum, which means to steal. Second, we have nushatzbat, which comes from tsade, b, and t, which we would find in the G system infinitive as sabatum, or to seize. And last, we have ushtatbik, which comes from the roots t, b, and k, which we would find in the G system infinitive as tabakum, or to pour. So first, looking at our prefix and suffix, we can identify that we have a third person plural feminine subject. That would be translated as they, the women. We can then look at the vowel which comes in between our second and third root letter, and we can immediately identify that this is not a durative tense, and it's either going to be a preterite or a perfect tense verb. Now, looking at our first sheen, we see that there's not a T following, so we know that this is going to be in the preterite tense. And we can translate this as they, the women, caused to steal, or they, the women, helped to steal. And this is going to change based off context the exact way we translate, but generally it's just going to carry that causative meaning of stealing. Now next we have nushatzbat, and based off this new prefix, we know that our subject is first person, common plural, we. Now based off the a which we find right here, we quickly can identify that this is in the durative tense, and we can translate this as we will help to seize or we help to seize. Lastly, we have ushtatbik, and we can see based off this T that we're, we're dealing with something. <clears throat> Lastly, we have ushtatbik, and based off this I and this T, we can quickly identify that this is the perfect tense. And based off the U, we know that our subject is either first person singular common or third person singular common. So we could translate this as I have helped to pour or I have caused to pour or he, she, or it has caused to pour or he, she, or it has helped to pour. So as you can see, there's a lot of different variations which we can get when we're translating the sheen system. So I think the best thing we can do is look at an actual Akkadian text in order to get a feel for what it's gonna be like translating a full sentence rather than just examples of the verb. So here we have law 127 from Himrabi's code. And in order to make our transliteration, we're gonna look at the drawing which was done by Bergman in the Codex Hammurabi Textus Primigenius, which was published in 1953. So to start, we're going to identify the values of each different cuneiform sign in order to form our transliteration, which we can then normalize and translate. So our first sign is the Shum sign, followed by Ma, A, and then next we have the Wiwa Pi sign. So for this transliteration, I'm only going to write out the sign value we need to use, but just remember that some of these signs have multiple meanings and we're just going to have to identify which meaning to use based off the context of the text. So next we have the we sign followed by the lum sign. On line two we have e followed by le, nin, which is a sumergram, and you can see that we've identified that based off the caps which we use to write the sign, and the dinger sumergram. Then we have u3, and this dash, which is what makes us call it the U3 sign, just shows us that this is the third attestation of the U. So it doesn't have any effect on the actual sound we're going to get, but it tells us which sign we're actually going to be looking at. Next we have the ash, which is kind of pushed up against this sha sign, and the at sign is next, followed by a, we, lim. On line four we have the U2 sign, and this just kind of demonstrates how we have the U3 and the U2 right above each other, and below each other. So this shows us that these are gonna give us the exact same sound, but they're just different signs. So it's helpful in our transliteration to denote that with these dashes so that when we're going back and we're trying to find the sign which gave us the reading, we can quickly identify it. So the U2 sign is followed by Ba, Nam, 
line five, we have the Utu sign again, followed by Sha, At, Ri, Its, with that Sade, Ma. Line six, we have La, Uk, Ti, In. Line seven, we have A, We, Lum, Shu, A, Ti. Then on line eight, we have Ma, Har. Then we have Da, A, A, and Ni. On line nine, we have I, Na, Ad, Sumergram, the Du Sumergram, Utu, and Shu. On line ten, we have the U3, followed by Mu, Ut, Ta, Su2. And we have some damage on the Su2 sign, but based off what we see with confidence, I think we can say that that is a Su2 sign because it appears in other parts of Hammurabi's code. So we can kind of look at what we have and we can identify what it is. On line 11, we have the U2 sign followed by Gal, La, and Bu. So now we have our transliteration, which tells us all of the syllables which we get from our sign readings. And next we're going to form this into a normalization. So line one, we have Shuma Awilum. Line two, Eli Intim. And as you can see, the Sumerigrams Nin and Dingir combine to form one Akkadian word, Intim. Then line three, we have U Ashat Awilum, U Banum, U Shatritz. And looking at U Shatritz, it looks like this might be a Shin system verb. Ma, which is just our participle, kind of working like a punctuation mark almost. La Uktin, Awilum, Shuati, Mahar, Dayani. And as you can see here, these doubling of the A signs, we've translated as a double Y. And that's just something that happens in spelling with cuneiform. We don't actually have the Y appear in the signs, but when we have a doubling of the A, we know that this was probably spoken with a Y sound. Then we have Inatuchu. And as you can see, these Sumerigrams have been translated into phonetic vowels, which isn't very common for Sumerigrams, but does happen. And I've checked this with the Hunerigard translation, so I'm pretty confident that that's what we're going to have. And interestingly enough, this ad Sumerigram would also appear as the at sign with this emphatic T. So it seems to be one of those things where it's kind of a hybrid phonetic use. And we see that sometimes with Sumerigrams, but it's, it's not too common. Then for tin, we have u mutasu and ugalabu to finish. So now we have our normalization and we can actually translate this into English. So first we have the word shuma. Shuma means if, followed by awilum. Awilum means free man or citizen and based off this um ending we know that it's in the nominative case so it's probably going to be our subject. Then we have eli which means upon or over as a preposition, followed by intim which is the genitive case of intum, which means priestess. And as you can see, this comes from that nandingir sumerigram, namdingir. And then we have u, which just means and or or, ashat, which means wife, and it's in the construct state. And the construct state is kind of a shortening where we have this case ending dropped off and it shows the word of. So it shows a relationship usually of possession or of a prepositional relationship. So awilum is going to be the subject of this construct state. So it's going to be of the man, the wife of a man. And that's again, free citizen in the M. So when we have a noun, which is in relation to another noun, and we see this first noun in the construct state showing that there's going to be an of, we're going to see the next noun take on this genitive case ending, M. Now for line four, we have ubanum, which means a finger or toe, and that's in the accusative. And we have ushatritz. So this is going to be our Sheen system verb. So as we can see, this comes from Taratsum, which in the G system would mean to stretch out. So in the Sheen system, we're going to have a causative meaning. So to cause to stretch out. As we can see, we have this in the preterite based off that I and the lack of a perfect T. And we know that based off this U, we have a third person singular common subject. And the reason we know that this isn't first person singular common, even though it could be based off the letter, is because in Himrabi's code, we don't have any sort of first person speech. So we don't have I, and it wouldn't make sense within this context. So we can identify it with confidence as a third person subject. On line six, we have la, which means not, and it's a negation usually used for verbs. And in this case, it's going to be in reference to the verb kanum, which comes next, meaning to be firm in the G system. But here we have the D system, so meaning make firm or to prove. So not having proved, which is talking about the accusation. Line seven, we have a wheelum, 
again, which means free man or citizen, and we have this in the nominative case. Then we have shuati, which is a pronoun, which means him, her, that, or the same. So that means a demonstrative pronoun in this case, this man. Next we have mahar, which comes from mahrum, which is again in the construct state. So as you can see, it doesn't have a case ending, and because of the doubling of this consonant before the case ending, the double H, R, we're going to add an A in between in order to make it mahar. Next we have dayanum, which uh, is judge. So in this case we have a plural genitive case, and that genitive case is important because it's showing connection to that construct state mahar. So that's going to add in that of to show the presence of the judges. Then next we have in that tushu, which is coming from natum, which means to hit or to beat. And here we have a G durative form with a third person, plural masculine subject. And we have this shu, which is an accusative suffix, which is third person singular. So that's going to mean he. So they will beat him. Next we have u, which means and or or. And in this case, it's going to mean and. Now we have mutasu. And we have a masculine possessive suffix again added, but it's assimilated to this last T in mutatum. And that just means half of a body part. So in this case, it's probably going to be referenced to hair because of this next verb, gullabum, which in the D system means to shave. So it's talking about them shaving half of his body, half of his hair. So now that we have our translation word by word, let's put it all together to get a more fluid translation. So Himrabi's Code, Law 127, I've translated as, If a man caused a finger to be pointed at a priestess or the wife of a man, but did not prove the accusation, this man will be put in front of the judges, and they will beat him, and they will shave half of his body. So here we can see the Sheen system in its full effect, talking about the cause of pointing the finger. So here's an interesting use of the Sheen system, and it looks like in Mesopotamia, if you cause someone to be accused of something, you could really be in trouble. So very interesting how in the punishment, they're going to shave half the body. And that's something that we see a lot in the ancient world, and it was just a sign of dishonor. So if you saw somebody walking around town and half of their head and half of their beard was shaved, you would know that they were not to be trusted and that they definitely had done something wrong. So thanks for watching Learn Acadian. I hope you enjoyed the episode and getting to actually translate some of him Robbie's code. And if you were wondering about the construct state, which we talked about, stay tuned for the next episode where I'm going to unpack actually how it works. So thanks for watching and happy translating.